we're going to learn the duties of the high priest and the priests and what these objects mean that we're going to find in the tabernacle what they stand for now I gave you on the paper the the gold, the silver, the bread, what all that means I gave, I put it down on that paper so if y'all go back and read the scriptures that, that are in the chapter that I've given you if you see the word gold, bronze, purple, scarlet, fine linen it tells you what those colors mean and what the fine linen means, what the wood means, what the oil means it'll help you out and it'll help you understand it better we're going to see that the courtyard stood for justifica justification the courtyard you got the diagram right there in front of you it's showing Jesus as the way coming into the courtyard and the holy place stood for sanctification showing that Jesus is truth and then the holy of holies stood for the glorification showing Jesus is life so that, like I said this tabernacle it symbolizes Jesus and that's what we're going to learn before we get any deeper into the sacri sacrifices let me explain why God went from animal sacrifices to his son Jesus to be sacrificed like I said we're going to go through this lesson that animal sacrifices were just temporary because Jesus was going to be the final sacrifice but one of the reasons they were temporary is the animal was to be spotless and they were but they weren't perfect we had to have the perfect sacrifice so this animal sacrifices was just a shadow of what was to come so when we talk about them that's keep that in mind the old tabernacle was designed by God but it was man who it was made by men and subject to mistakes as we'll see later they did they did have some mistakes the priests made some mistakes but we'll, we'll get to that later. So it wasn't perfect. And it's the same way the churches are today. The Lord made the church. He said, this is what I want in the church. But just like the tabernacle, it's not perfect. But he did make the church. That's why we should go to church. Even if you don't agree with everything they say or do, you're not going to find the perfect church. When you ask the Lord to show you where to go, what church to go to, he's going to give it to you. He's going to show you. But don't think because he showed you it's going to be a perfect church. Because like I said, church is run by man. But we do have some churches that are moving in the spirit of God. But we have some churches that are not. We have churches today that are just businesses. That's all they are. It's just like a business. They keep track of everything. They keep track of how much money they make. How much money it cost this. And they use the tithe money for stuff that's not, in, not, that's not biblical. It is a business. Hate to say that, but churches churches today are getting further away from the Lord. It's it's hard to find a good church that's in the spirit of God and walks with the Lord. But it's going to get worse because as the as the time grows near, the end times, as it gets closer, this world, these people are going to get further and further away from the Lord. And the reason God sent His Son. One reason is that is he was the perfect sacrifice. But them animals were not perfect. And it had also, the second reason he sent his son instead of keeping animals, the reason he sent his son, because I have a teaching on this, it's called, Who is Your King? It had to be a man to defeat the devil. Animals couldn't defeat the devil. Because of Satan defeating Adam, the man, the king at that time, since he defeated a man, God is a justified God. He said, okay, since you defeated a man, I'm going to have a man defeat you. So that's why Jesus had to come on and defeat the devil. By getting sacrificed, by giving his blood, going to the grave. But the victory was he resurrected from the grave. I mean, dying on the cross, that didn't do it. Going to the grave didn't do it. Him resurrecting from the grave is what defeated the devil. But anyway, that's, that's why the, the Lord went from animal, animal sacrifices to his son. Just in case someone had a question on that. You know, why go from animal and then send your son? Now, the duties of the high priest. The high priest had to be chosen by God. Men, didn't, men did not choose the high priest. 
God chose the high priest. And they had to be like us, understanding on on temptations. So they had to understand our temptations so they could so they know how to minister to us. Not only are we going to be speaking about the high priest and the tabernacle, but we're gonna Jesus was our high priest when he was here on earth, and he still is our high priest. In Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands, and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place, speaking about the holies of holies, once for all time, and secured our redemption forever. So they had, they had to be the high priest, and Jesus is our high priest. Back then they had men as high priests in the Old Testament, but our high priest today is Jesus. Hebrews 4 verse 15, and then Hebrews 5 verses 1 and 2. Just as we're going to learn the responsibilities of the high priest and the tabernacle, we're going to learn that Jesus has the same responsibility as they did. So as I'm talking about the uh, duties of the high priest on the tabernacle, Jesus had the same responsibilities here when he was here. It says in verse 15, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faces all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. Now this is Jesus. When we were when we're in trouble or we're hurt hurting or disresponded or or we being strongly tempted, we want to share our feelings with someone. Someone who can understand us. And that is Jesus. He can sympathize with us, our weaknesses. Because he was he walked the earth. He went through the same temptations we did. Remember, Jesus was a hundred percent man. He was just he was tempted just like we were. And that's why he's able to understand our our weaknesses when we do go to him now Lord help me because of whatever like the things I just said he can help us because he can understand it now speaking about the priests of the tabernacles it says in verse 1 of, of chapter 5 every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealing with God he presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins and he is able to deal gently with ignorant, meaning misguided, and wayward, meaning people who are going astray, people because he himself subject to the same weakness. Okay, these priests were subject to the same weakness as the people are. These priests, not Jesus, these priests. These priests could get misguided and they could go astray. Remember, they're, they're men. They're not perfect Jesus. They're high priests, but they're men. It's shown here that there are three basic quali for qualifications for being a high priest. It shows that he had to be appointed by God. He had to be sympathetic with the people to minister to them. He had to offer sacrifice on their behalf. They had only one high priest at a time. Now we're talking about high priests. Now they had several pri priests in the tabernacle, but there was only one high priest. Then you had your regular priest. And the high priest was in charge of the entire priestly order. They looked over the tabernacle, make sure the other the priests were doing what they needed to do the way God said it. Now the high priest also, there were mediators between God and, and Israel, just like Jesus is with us. Because 1 Timothy 2 5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So they they were the same. The high priests in the tabernacle did the same thing Jesus did. Aaron was Israel's first high priest, and Moses was his brother. They were from the tribe of Levi. Levites were priests, but only Aaron and his sons could be high priests. The reason the Levites were chosen was because when Moses came down from getting the Ten Commandments, you know how to. How the Israelites were down there, they made a golden calf and started worshiping the golden calf, and they were just in all kind of sex sin, and they were just in sin, living in sin. And when Moses came down, he saw it, and he said, he yelled at him and said, "Those who are for God, who want to be for God, live for the Lord. Come, come on His side. Come where He is." And the only ones that went over there were the Levites. So God blessed the Levites and made them priests. 
That's how they became priests, because of that action. If you weren't qualified to be a high priest, this was not good. Numbers 3, verse 10. Appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out the duties of the, of the priesthood. But any unauthorized person who goes too near to the sanctuary in the tabernacle must be put to death. So the high priests were well, the only ones who could go into the Holy of Holies to minister before the mercy seat. You know, you got the Ark of the Covenant in there. And those of y'all who remember what it looks like, well, the top of it was called the mercy seat. Now, Leviticus 16.11, it says, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself. See, they would, they would have to do this then to offer sacrifice for others. And the, and the high priest, they only did this once a year. You go into the holies of holies. They only went in there once a year. Now, you got to make sure you separate the holies of holies from the altar in the courtyard. In the courtyard, they made sacrifices every day, every morning, every evening. But in the holies of holies, the high priest went in there only once, once a year. The high priest only carried the blood of the animals. They would sacrifice them outside in the courtyard, and then the high priest would only take the blood and would sprinkle it over the mercy seat. So it wasn't the animal taken in there, it was just their blood that went into the holies of holies. And the rest of the animal, they would burn outside the camp. And they did that with certain animals. I'm going to show you later, there's different kind of sacrifices. So I'll get to that later. The priest would always bless the people on God's behalf. When we see Leviticus 9.22 After that, Aaron raised his hands toward the people and blessed them. Then after presenting the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering, he stepped down from the altar. So it shows that Aaron, the high priest, would bless the people for God. Also in Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, and then they would pronounce the blessing on whatever it is. So he used the high priest to bless the Israel. Now this is all the high priest we're talking about mainly. In Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 9 and 10, The Levites obeyed your word and guarded your covenant. They were more loyal to you than their own parents. They ignored their relatives and did not acknowledge their own children. What this is saying here, they put God first. This, was, this is what they did. And this is the way we should be. Because in Matthew 10.34, the New Testament, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So the Lord is plainly saying right here, I need to come first. You put your, your family first, you're not worthy of me. You put anybody first, you're not worthy of them. And in verse 10 it says, They teach your regulations to Jacob. They give your instructions to Israel. They present incense before you and offer whole burnt offerings on the altar. Now the Levites, they were to teach Israel. The priests, the Levites, they were the ones who taught Israel. They showed them the Lord's instructions, His commands, and wisdoms on the, on the law. That was in their hands to do, to teach Israel. And they taught the leaders and the people about the covenant also, not just the tabernacle, but about the covenant. This is res those are responsibilities of the priests. The priests also, as you can see here, also guarded God's sanctuary and guarded the people from the sanctuary, which we can see that in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Aaron's son, Nabad, and Abihu put goals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the, the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire. The Lord, the Lord told them what kind of fire to burn. And we see here, these two burnt the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Because, they're, because they burnt the wrong fire, 
No, the tabernacle, you're going to see how serious God is with the tabernacle. When he says, I want it done this way, he means it. Also in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, But when they arrived at the thresh floor of Nakon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzan reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was, an, was aroused against Azad, and God struck him dead because of this. So Azad died right there beside the ark of God. God didn't want nobody to touch the ark. Nobody. When they carried, they carried it by the handles that went through the ark. But they never touched it. God, that was a command of God. And, and because, this, because it was stumbling, because of the, the oxen stumbling, and it looked, it looked like it was going to fall, this guy just reaches over to keep it from falling. You think he's doing a good thing. But God said, I, I don't want nobody to, no one touching this ark. And he meant it. So when we hear the word of God today, don't play with his words. Don't play with his commandments. We've seen in the, in the New Testament where, where some of them were killed right there on the spot for disobeying, for lying. We as being Christians, we need to be very serious about our walk with the Lord. Very serious. Nothing to play with. We need to be serious. Because if we're not, it's very dangerous. But if we are, if we walk with Him, it's nothing but blessings. Amen? Amen. Through these scriptures and the scriptures we've learned before, do not take the Word of God lightly. Too many of us do. Too many Christians take it lightly. Before the tabernacle, the head of the family would act as the role of priest. This was before the tabernacle. The head of the family would, would take the role of the priest on. Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 through 4. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for sacrifice, one animal for each household. Now, we know that men are the head of the family, right? We already know that. Men, we have great responsibility. Great responsibility. We have to walk with the Lord a little closer than, our, than others. Just like preachers, if you got a ministry, if you have a uh, 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 if you're a preacher, or a teacher, an evangelist, you gotta have a little closer walk with the Lord than than other Christians. Not not because uh, we're closer to the Lord or anything like that. It's just people. If we carry that title, then we have to watch it. You know, well, look at that preacher. He's over there drinking. Well, they don't know that it's okay to drink. They see him drink and they already think he's a drunk. So he can't have that. He can't have people talking like that about him. So he has to be a little more careful than other Christians. It's just like here. Our responsibilities are great. A real Christian family can look at another Christian family and they, they know what the responsibility of the man is. The father, the husband. And when they look at the family, the wife and the children, and they're not walking with the Lord, then you look at the man. He's the head, right? If they're not walking with the Lord, then who's, who's at fault? The man is. The father, the husband. So look at the kids or look at the wife. If they're not right and walking right with the Lord, it's the husband's fault. It's the father's fault. Like I said, the responsibility of men are very great. And most men, most husbands, fathers don't know it. And I'm talking about born again Christian husbands and fathers. They don't, they don't take that responsibility partly because it's not really taught that much in the church. And that's the church's fault. Well, that's the, the preacher's fault. God puts the preacher there to, just like Paul said, he was going to give us the whole counsel of God. Well, that's what preachers are, are supposed to do. Gives the whole counsel of God. But there's, there's a lot of stuff they won't preach on. Because they don't want to offend somebody. They don't want to lose members. You lose members, that means you lose money. We need real men of God in the church. That's why they're so hard to find right now. You got more antichrists out there than you do men of God. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. I see it. The priest, the high priest, would represent the people to God by five different sacrifices. 
they had the burnt offering. This offering was taken. Now you're not going to be able to write all this because that's just a lot here. Yeah. Don't try to keep up with it. <laughs> the burnt offering. This offering was taken in the morning and in the evening, also for special days like the Sabbath. The animal was for this sac sacrifice would be a young bull, a lamb, a goat, a turtle dove, or a young pigeon. The type of animal chosen for this sacrifice seems to be dependent on the financial financial ability of the one who brings the offering. So the, the, the pigeons were, were, were very cheap. So if you was a poor family, you would bring a pigeon. But if you were a family of wealth, you would bring a bull. You understand? The one bringing the offering was to lay down, to lay a hand on the animal, indicating that the animal was taken the person's place, and then he was killed by that person. The animal was killed by that person. This is what they had to do for the burnt offering. Now the sin offering, this was designed to purify the sanctuary from sin that was committed unintentionally and thereby allowed God to continue dwelling with the people. The one bringing the offering, again, would place their hand on the animal and then they would slaughter it. Now these are the different offerings they had at the, at the gate. They had the guilt offering. This offering was for someone who took something illegally was expected to repay it. They were they were expected to repay it in full plus twenty percent of the value. Then bring a ram for the offering. They would sacrifice a ram for the offering. Other reasons included cleansing of a leopard, or for those who had sex sin with a female slave of another person. These were four guilt offerings. These are the people who had that kind of offering. Now the peace offering. This offering was, uh, <coughs> was required a bull, a cow, a lamb, or a goat. And they, had, they couldn't have any kind of defect. They had to be, uh, like I said a while ago, spotless animals. Not perfect, but spotless. And the person would lay hands on the animal and they would kill it. Only certain parts of the animal, of the organs, were burnt. The one who offered the sacrifice was given the meat. But the parts that weren't burnt, they would give it to the person who offered it, and it would be given to them as a meal of celebration. This offering was brought in response to an unexpected blessing or an answer to prayer. The idea of thanksgiving was associated with the peace offering. That, that offering was really for celebration, for the blessings God gave them. And so it's a more of a thanksgiving. Now the gain offering... The grain offering. This offer was from the harvest of the land. This offering is the only one that didn't require ble any bloodshed. Sometimes this offering was cooked into cakes. Every grain offering had to have salt in it. It may symbolize the recognition of God's blessing on the harvest. So that was more of a uh, thank you Lord for what you've done for us. You've given us a good crop and you're showing your thankfulness by doing this grain offering. Yes, this is not a blood sacrifice. And like I said, this is the only one that's not a blood. It didn't require blood. Now the regular priest would get involved in all these sacrifices. Now these were high priests who, who, uh, who sacrificed. But the regular priest would help in these sacrifices. And these, these were the responsibilities of the priest, of the high priest. So to understand that, now we can go into the courtyard. The courtyard is the big, the big part of the uh, tabernacle. The first thing that we see was the tabernacle's outer court, which was enclosed by a curtain, a fence made of a curtain. There was only one way into the court, and this was through an entrance on the east side of the uh, tabernacle. This entrance itself is a picture of the Lord Jesus. He is the door, he is the gate, he is the only entrance entrance into salvation. You're gonna see, we're going to see that the tabernacle is, is the picture of Jesus. Remember that. It's a picture of Jesus. When we're finished, we'll see it. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 6 through 9, Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, 
but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. So the gate to the tabernacle, there was only one. And it's a symbol of Jesus. He's, he was called the gate. He's called the door. And right here it says, the true sheep did not listen to those thieves and robbers. How did they know they were thieves and robbers? Because they studied the word of God. We have thieves and robbers today. They're, they're called false prophets, false teachers. They're called antichrists. So we have them, they had them back then, they have them today. And the only way the true sheep are going to know them is by knowing God's word. You cannot know a, a, a wolf by just being a Christian. Right. You got to know what a wolf is. The word of God tells us what wolves are and what they do. In the courtyard, the priest would offer sacrifices on a bronze altar, which stood in the center of the courtyard. And one of the, one of the they had those sacrifices that I gave you earlier, and another sacrifice was they would bring two goats to the altar. One goat was a blood sacrifice, and the blood was sprinkled seven times on the mercy seat. In Leviticus, Leviticus sixteen fifteen, it says, "Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering." that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil that's the holy of holies and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat the priest would announce the sins of the people over the scapegoat and the priest would let the goat leave into the wilderness and the people would witness their sins leave on that goat so one day would sacrifice the other one they would let go into the, into the wilderness. The sin offering provided forgiveness, while the other goat provided removal of sin. They would see their, their, their sins going away through this goat. So one was sacrificed for forgiveness. The other one was, was there just to remove the sin. And that was called the scapegoat. But these were the kind of sacrifices they had. Let me show you the difference between remission of sin and forgiveness of sin. Because most, some, most of these were forgiveness for, for sins. But there is a remission of sins. And they're, 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 they're different. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It doesn't say forgiveness. It says no remission. We're going to see what that means. Remission, remission has a different meaning from forgiveness. Forgiveness, you get every time you sin. Every time we sin, we get forgiveness, right? Remission of sins is the Lord has already, He's ready to forgive us for pretty much rejecting Him. Okay, you did not believe in me. But because you believe in me now, you have remission. Now you are forgiven from, from now and from all on. Remission of sin is of sin, rejecting the Lord. Forgiveness of sin are the sins we commit once we're Christian. Hope you understand that. Romans 3, 25. It says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. It doesn't say sins. For sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shed in his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in time past. So you have remission of sin. That's when God forgives you for not, for not believing in Him. And then you have forgiveness of sins. Those are sins we commit once we become a Christian and we ask for forgiveness. I hope I explained that good enough yeah. for you. Now I got it. <laughs> <laughs> now the bronze altar, the altar was where they had fire and smoke of the daily offerings. It reminded the people that God is a holy God. This fire never went out. It burnt continuously. The altar burned continuously, day and night. The altar also showed the necessity of sacrifice and the shedding of blood to enter into God's presence. That's what it showed. The altar had four horns on the corners to bind the animal down when they were to sacrifice it. And these horns also symbolize God's power over life and death. That's what they symbolized. Many Israelites would go to the altar and grab the horns, 
when they thought they were going to die or something, they would run in there and they'd grab the horns. And like in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50, 51, it says, verse 50, Ad Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. So he rushed to the tabernacle and grabbed onto the horns of the altar. Word soon, soon reached Solomon that Adonijah had sieged siege horns of the altar in fear and that he was pleading, let King Solomon swear today that he will not kill me. If you read the rest of the verses, you'll see that he didn't kill him. He, he, he let him, he let him free of what the problem was. Today, God is asking us to come to the altar, to the cross. You know, the altar today is the cross. That's what the altar is. Where was Jesus crucified? On the cross. So that was an altar. He shed his blood on the cross. So the, the altar is the cross now. Those of us who accept unto ourselves the sacrifice that was made over nearly 2,000 years ago, we grab on to the horns like these people like these people did, so to speak, we grab onto those horns as Christ was our substitute that day, like he was back then. He took the place that we deserve he took the place that we deserve death, right? Wages of sin is death. Well he took that place for us. So we can find mercy and eternal life through the payment that he paid his life on. So we could have life, so we could have forgiveness. The difference between animal sacrifices and Jesus is the animal sacrifices, they had to be tied down. Those animals didn't die voluntarily. Did Jesus go to the cross? You know, remember, Jesus could have left. He could have called a legion of angels to come and save him, but he didn't. So he went willingly to the cross. He went willingly to the altar. But that's, between, that's the difference between the animal sacrifices. They had to be tied down. Jesus went freely. Amen? Amen. And Jesus was showing his love for us by doing that. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Sacrifices were offered every day, in the morning and in the evening. And the bronze altar was overlaid with brass, which the Bible it shows in the Bible that it's, that it's symbolic of sin, which you'll see that in Leviticus 26:19. I will break your proud spirit by making the skies as unyielding as iron and the earth as hard as brass, representing sin. So brass represents sin, and that's why the, the altar was covered with brass, because it was taking on sin, killing the sin.